ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia here to draw another buggy with you. Um, I see Susan is in the chat right now. Um, hello, Susan. Um, very, very cool. Um, here's the thing. Uh, last week you asked me what we wanted to draw today, and you said, a fly! And I have a whole bunch of flies. In fact, I do have flies that are actually identified, but I like this fly. I haven't shown it off to anybody yet. It's newly pinned, so I haven't spent the time to, like, dive into it and see if I can identify it. But I absolutely love these little hairs on the hind leg. Um, I think that it makes the fly look fancy, okay? And so, um, instead of giving it, um, instead of having an identification for it, I figured we can observe it together, um, <clears throat> if that's okay with you guys. Um, hi, Hashi! Uh, I was actually trying to see, because... Um, it is so new that it doesn't have its locality label on it just yet. And its location label is sitting right here somewhere. So I thought that if I could... Here it is. Yep, that's it. Okay, so this fly is from Brendan T. Byrne State Forest Campground in New Jersey. Um, it was collected in July. I wonder if that's right. Of 2022. So I guess, um, it was in my, it just, it just doesn't have a label just yet. Um, so that's fine though. So it was found in Brennan State Park. Um, I can zoom out a little bit further so we can get a full length measurement on this, uh, this, uh, friend. Let's see. So from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, you see the fly is bent a little bit, so it's not exactly straight, but, so I'm gonna kind of imagine it straightening out its abdomen just a little bit and kind of give you an estimate. It looks like the length of this fly from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, if the abdomen was straight, would be about 0.9 centimeters. So I can tell you um, things that I already know about this fly just from looking at it. Um, I'm gonna double check. I'm pretty sure this is a clip threat fly. Yeah. All right, so um, we don't know exactly what species of fly this is, but I can tell you it is a calyptrate fly, um, meaning that it has calyptor, calyptors, which are essentially an organ like a um, an additional little appendage that looks like a flap that covers the um, that covers the halter. And because we haven't drawn very many flies just yet, um, I don't know how many of you will recognize that word. Um, the halter is a fly's adaptation um, from the hind wing. Flies only have two wings, and so they only have a front pair of wing. And in replacement of the hind wing, they have halters. And um, what those are are essentially fly gyroscopes. They help them balance in the air, make sure that they stay steady, and it's why flies are such good flyers. Also, um, flies are, uh, that is correct, flies are the, evolutionarily, flies are the newest order. So they are like the most adapted, most um, yep, yep, yep. Evolutionarily, they were, came around last. Ah, good legs! Yes, very, very much so. Um, so, that's why, that's why we're going to draw this fly today. Um, and maybe I'll, um, 
and maybe over the course of the class while I'm looking at it and, um, and, and drawing out characteristics, we might be able to identify it together as we are, as we're going through characteristics. Um, <coughs> or if anybody wants to attempt to um, picture ID it during the process, I invite you to do that. Uh, okay. Yay! Awesome. So, way up here in the top, I am just going to write for for our identification. I'm gonna write calyptrate fly, calyptrate diptera, and then underneath it, I'm gonna put unknown. And then once we identify it, I can change that. Wait, does this fly have hairy eyeballs? Um, I'm not sure. Let's go check it out. No, this fly does not have hairy eyeballs. What it does have are very large compound eyes um, with many, many, many facets. All of those little individual lenses in a compound eye are called omatidia. Um, if you had been wondering about that word, um, omatidia is the plural form of omatidium, which would be one of those individual lenses within the compound eye. Um, all flies are in this order, Diptera, so it's uh, it's why I wrote Clyptrate Dipterin. Um, Diptera is a fun word that we can break down really, really easily. Di meaning two, and Terra, P-T-E-R-A, like a pterodactyl, it means wings. So um, you've got an, an entire order named after the fact that they only have two wings. Yes, they have fluffy gold eyeliner. That would be a true statement. If we looked really close there at the edge, that does look, yeah, that's Cetos. And um, flies tend to have both kind of hairs and then what we call bristles. Um, we don't really use the word bristles for any other order, not that I can think of. Um, and when we're saying hair with diptera, a lot of times it's very, very thin and kind of covers the entire body, like um, the CD on a golden dung fly. Oh, I've got a really cool picture of a golden dung fly here. I'll show you really quick. Right, so in flies, this would be um, um, my, one of my images of the golden dung fly, and you can see how all of those, those are seedy, those are hairs, and they're thin and fluffy and they kind of cover the abdomen, whereas when you're looking at um, this fly here, you can see sometimes they have those very thick individual, what look like hairs, we would call those bristles. Um, I'm sure that it has something to do with the socket that they're connected to or their function, but I'm not exactly sure what that would be. We are all still learning. <laughs> oh no! but the middle leg is just twisted and upside down. No big deal. We got this, guys. 
Flies are not as smart like spiders, but they detect movement. Yeah, so um, flies are going to have those, maybe that's what it is, maybe um, the flies are sensing um, the world around them, like the, uh, the movement, like air currents and movement with all of those fun bristles. Ready. And welcome, Nature Up Close. I don't know if you've chatted with us before. I'm, I, uh, I'm excited that you're hanging out with us here today. Alright, so I'm getting us a good image of the entire body of this fly so that we can get our first sketch on and then we'll go ahead and zoom in and see all of the other fun characteristics. And some mammals have coarse hairs we call bristles too, like boars. Yeah! I, that, I guess that could be it, just like the thickness of the hairs. Alright. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this fly, so when you pin flies, um, flies' heads are kind of on a stalk from the thorax. And so they tend to be able to be very, very, um, they can move a whole bunch. And so the fly heads tend to kind of turn on you while you pin them, or at least they turn on me while I pin them. And so the fly's head is just a little bit crooked. Um, we're going to straighten it out in our drawing. Um, I'm going to start out with a really light sketch of kind of a flattened D-shape head. So I'm going to start with a vertical line that's nice and light, and then I'm going to create this kind of backwards D, but instead of going out as far as I normally would, I'm going to kind of keep it fl a little bit flatter here for, uh, for our start for our head. Um, and then because we know that there's that little peg, we want to make sure that the, um, that the head connects at a very narrow point, not all the way up at the top and all the way up down at the bottom, but somewhere right there in the middle here. Um, the, uh, thoracic region does kind of arch and go above the level of the head here. So if we take this guy, we're going to arch it up kind of past the head here, and then um, it's going to be hard to see some of those characteristics because of the wings that I didn't leave enough room for. Uh, I'm going to scooch my drawing down really quick. So um, this thorax is coming up a little bit higher than the head and is going to come on over here. Um, we can't see the end of this thoracic region just yet, so I'm going to kind of just box it off. And then when we see it a little bit better, we might be able to um, adapt it and change it a little. Um, and then the connection of the abdomen... It's not really low like a bee, a wasp, or an ant, right? These wasps and ants, they kind of connect way down here at the bottom of the thorax. This fly is going to kind of connect right up here almost. Uh, we're going to call it just a little bit under halfway. So if you imagine that halfway point, just go a little bit under that, and that's where our fly's abdomen is going to connect to. This fly does not have a very large bulbous abdomen. It's kind of thin. Um, I'm making this abdomen here kind of both arched up a little bit so that it stays nice and thin. And then we do have wings here, so I'm going to go ahead and just get a really light sketch for the wings coming up, going out to a point, and then coming back down. 
And if we do end up identifying the family of fly that we are looking at, um, the likelihood is we are going to be using the bristles on the head and thorax along with the uh, wing venation to identify the majority of fly families. Uh, that gives us a good amount of body here. I am going to draw some stick legs in because I'm thinking that the mouth parts are going to get a little bit complicated. Uh, scooch this down so I can slouch. <laughs> All right. Um, so that femur is going to be coming down towards the ground. The tibia is coming. Wait a minute. Cool. Never mind. This segment that's coming down from the thorax is not the femur. This is a coxa. This is that hip bone. So the femur is the one that is coming up and forward. And then the tibia kind of comes down like this. And then you have tarsal segments that I'm not going to add stick, sticks to yet. The, uh, the middle leg and the hind legs are both a little bit separated from the front leg. So if you take, if you see your front legs way up here, you would take the middle leg and put it a little bit past the halfway point here. And this middle leg is going to be kind of going backwards like this. And then for our hind leg, it's going to be coming off right at the, um, right at the end of this thorax here. And the coccyx is going to be a little bit shorter on this one. And then the femur, <clears throat> the femur is this one that comes all the way up. And it looks like I pulled my abdomen up a little bit. So I don't think that the femur is going to go above the abdomen. But the femur is the long one that comes up. And then that, um, that part on the hind leg where you have that huge amount of like a uh, all of these hairs here, those are going to be on the tibia. And then you've got tarsal segments that are coming out, out, and out. Cool. So uh, that gives us a really nice kind of light outline for our fly here before we uh, zoom in and check some of this stuff out. Um, awesome. stuff here to talk about. Alright, so this is the head of our, this is the head of our fly. Um, <clears throat> you can see that it has these absolutely ginormous compound eyes. Um, generally, it's something that all flies are going to have. Um, and I'm going to be starting with those. So just making sure that they stay nice and round. Um, I'm actually going to be going a little bit past this straight line here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my compound eye up close to, this, the, to the top of the head. And I'm going to make sure that it stays nice and round and covers most of the head I've already sketched out here. But then, once I get back to this flat space, I'm just going to make sure that it arches, it continues to arch back out and kind of rounds back in together. Alright, so that gives us one absolutely ginormous compound eye. Um, I'll erase any of the sketch lines on the center that I don't need. And then inside of compound eyes, I like to crosshatch. Just indicate that this is where all of those omatidia are. Okay. Now, um, with the head of our fly, uh, with the head of our fly, now that we can see it from a straight lateral point of view, 
you can see that the antenna come off of almost a, a ridge. Excuse me, I just picked up the hiccups. Okay. Um, it comes up off of a ridge here. So I'm going to start a little bit forward on this compound eye, and I'm going to kind of come up, give myself the start of the, of the head. Up here on the top of the head would be the, the fronds. I'll have to think about the word. Um, and it comes on down, and right about here, I think, is where we are going to create this little bit of a shelf. And that's going to be where the, uh, where the Aristate antenna come off. Um, that is a fun word. Um, this front of the head, or the fronds, is going to be concave, so kind of folded in towards the compound eye here. Um, and then it comes back out and kind of flattens out. It's going to wrap back around. See, I'm going to leave a couple of these lines blank because I already know that my front leg is going to be coming through this spot. Um, so I'm leaving some of these lines. So, a uh, word that I mentioned. Aristate uh, antenna. Um, Aristate antenna are commonly found in flies. I um, do not know of any other insects. I don't, I've never seen another insect with an Aristate antenna, so you could almost say that it was a distinguishing characteristic. So we're going to zoom in really close to these guys. Um, sometimes people will call the Aristate antenna sausage shaped. Um, just because they're kind of round and bulbous and they just kind of hang there in the front of the head. Um, they're, these Aristate antenna just kind of hang down some, I don't know if I've ever seen them actually kind of move forward and do this type of thing. Um, but they're kind of fun. The, you can see that there are just the two segments. There's this segment here that's kind of triangular, and then there's this one that's fairly bulbous. Um, so we just have the two segmented Aristate antenna here. One little triangular segment, one little round segment. Now, the thing with the little round segment at the bottom is that it is going to have one distinct bristle that um, it's right here. It's coming towards the microscope a little bit, so it's almost just a little bit out of focus, but if I pull the focus up a little bit, there, you can see the bristle coming off of that second segment. That hair is important, and we're going to add it. So just off of the very end of the bottom, we're going to go boop. And now it, the Aristate antenna has that little hair. The reason why I find that hair important um, and more important than all of the other ones is that one has a name. Um, uh, that one hair at the end of the Aristate antenna is called the Arista. The entire antenna type is named after that hair. Uh, so I figure might as well draw it. All right. Another thing that we are going to be checking out is the mouth parts. Just so cool. seeing that I am not exactly sure about, but I'll share it with you. These two things up here, those are multi-segmented and in connection with the mouth parts, so I would call them palps. Um, I don't, um, I don't know if I've ever seen them so large here, so that's kind of cool. I'm not sure if they would be maxillary palps or labial palps, because I'm not sure exactly where they are connected in the mouth parts, but um, those little two segmented guys are palps. Um, I am going to make those, so if 
so bloop, 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 bloop. All right, I'm gonna make these pelts come out kind of right here underneath those, um, underneath this leg. Um, so it's got these two kind of cute little pelts. Now, um, also this thing, this right here, this is the mouth part. Flies have a sponging mouth part, and their mouth part has um, almost a hinge in it. So if I was going to draw like almost a cartoon version of this mouth part, I would take a segment, I would bring it back kind of like this, and then I would bring a segment forward more like this, and then I would give it kind of this flat piece here with little itty bitty hairs. All right, and that connects, and this and this whole thing connects to the head. All right, so that is kind of what we are seeing here on the fly, but what we are seeing is we're not seeing this part. We're just seeing this, the end, and the sponge on the bottom of the mouth part. So flies, um, when they land on food, generally they're tasting with their feet, and then um, if they like what they taste, they regurgitate onto the food. They spit up enzymes onto the food that is going to start to break down the food. It starts to, essentially, they start their digestion process outside of their body. Um, so then once it becomes kind of like a goopy muck of food, they'll use this, um, they'll use the bottom of this mouth part here um, kind of like a little sponge and they sponge up their food. Um, and all of these little uptake hairs um, are going to help with that. Uh, all right. So if I'm going to be adding this here, I can almost say that the mouth part's coming backwards towards the leg and underneath, but then the, it's gonna come out maybe right around here. Yeah, so I'm imagining that my mouth part is coming backwards from here and moving forward. So that's going to be my little sponging mouth part for this Y. And I think that his head is actually doing pretty good so far. It's cute. Um... So if a fly lands on my food, should I be concerned about sharing saliva? Or would its digestive enzymes just help me digest my food, too? Um, you don't have to be worried about di about um, eating fly spit. Um, I can't think of any flies... Let me think. I cannot think of any flies that will transmit any type of disease or anything through that enzyme. There are flies that transmit diseases when they actually bite a person, but I've never heard of a disease that transmitted in that in their spit. Morning, Chaos! Welcome! Oh, I have to zoom out of the microscope. It's like, why is everything so close? Okay. Now, um, in fly taxonomy, you have something that gets a little wonky. Um, each one of these thoracic sclerites, let's see, I'll spell that for you. Um, each one of these thoracic sclerites here are little individual pieces of their armor, and the number of bristles on individual thoracic sclerites helps you identify the clyptrit flies, which is why I haven't identified him yet. 
um, there is a really, really cool interactive diagram on fly anatomy, and I want to share it with you. So um, I'm going to pull it up really quick. I do have a, um, I do have it linked. The last time I went to go and find it, um, it may have been broken, but I want to go and see if it's still up. Maybe we should draw, and I'll pull it up. I'll pull it up at the end of class. Just remind me. Don't let me forget. We are not drawing a common house fly today. We are drawing a fly of un unknown origin. <laughs> Um, well, it's from New Jersey, and it has this really, really cool bristly hind tibia. It's definitely not a housefly. Um, yeah, we're trying, we're going to see if we can identify it. Um, it's going to be fun. Okay. So, let's see. I wonder... I know. So I am pulling up one of my, my fly cheat sheet to see if there is I need to get to the clip rate flies. We'll see about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, flies are uh, flies are one that are a little bit trickier for me, but that was requested during our live stream last week, and I can't turn you guys down. All right. So. Right, the first segment of this fly here connects right here about to the head and it comes up about halfway up this hill here and then comes on down to right around here. So this is going to be essentially the top of the first segment of the thorax so you could almost consider it the pronotum if it was any other insect. But flies get their own words. So I don't know what we call this um, sclerite here. Uh, but on that sclerite, there are three distinct bristles that come backwards. And because the bristles are key for identification of these flies, we're going to be drawing them. Um, now, after it comes around and down, that is actually where our coxa is going to be touching that segment here. So, I'm going to erase kind of where this fly's head is connected and kind of bring it up just a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna create this little itty bitty segment here so that that's kind of like the underneath side of the, uh, the first segment of the thorax so that we can add this coxa here. And um, we're gonna do the fly from the front to the end. We're gonna do the legs as we go. Um, so this right here is going to be the coxa, spelled C-O-X-A, and it's going to be coming down from our guy, and he's going to go right about here to the edge of that. So we've got that front leg coming down. It is going to be significantly separate from the middle leg, so what we are going to end up doing is kind of bringing this segment down more like this and separating that coxa from the rest of the body. Um, the femur is coming up, and in this specimen, it's coming kind of straight up so that it's overlapping the coxa, but I want it to move forward like this fly was standing. And so that is why my fly's femur is going right through his, 
kind of right through his head. Um, and now we're going to scooch the microscope forward just a little bit so we can see the tibia. about that same length for the tibia. Um, there are two tibial spines. I know that there are a handful of us out there who love to hear about the tibial spines. Um, so there are two tibial spines and those spines are on the um, underside here. So I'm going to add those cute little spine friends. And now um, we get those tarsal segments. Now The tarsal segments are essentially the fly's toe segments. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Um, they, he appears to have four tarsal segments on the front leg. So this first one is... I would say about three quarters of the length of the tibia. All right. The second segment is half of the first. The third segment is just shorter than the second. So each one gets smaller and smaller. And then this last segment here, we're going to call it a raindrop shape, narrow in the base, round at the end. It also does have, I'm going to make the first segment narrower. Um, it also does have two tarsal claws and a pulvoid, it looks like. Let's see. Rotate. Let's see. Pulvoid. All right. So if we rotate this fly's <laughs> Liking tarsal tibial spines does not make you weird. It makes you 100% normal here. They're kind of fun. They kick they can kick with them or clean their I like when they clean their antenna with their tip with their tibial spines. Okay. So I'm trying to get this to focus all right, but what we're looking at is not the fly's head. So don't mind the fact that that is all blurred out. What I'm looking at is right about here. This is the, the tarsal claw at the very end. Um, right here and here, those are sharp. Those are the tarsal claws. But underneath the tarsal claws, flies have pulvilli. And these are essentially toe pads. Um, so if we look right here and here, those additional two little pieces, those are the little toe pads. They exist underneath the tarsal seg the tarsal claws. And I haven't done any reading about it. Uh, but I would make the assumption that those that those tibial pads, that those pulvilli, are what it uses for. Um, for tasting. I would guess that there are sense that those are not only toe pads but also sensory organs. And that is going to be really hard to show at the end of this leg, but if you really wanted to, you could make a really big picture of it and kind of zoom in and say, "Hey, this is what it looks like. You've got um The end of the last tarsal segment, you've got one claw, two claws, but then underneath them you've got these little toe pads. Okay, let's get back to the fly's body. The pole fly function as an adhesive system. Oh, that's cool! 
Thank you, Hashi. I appreciate it. Um, so the pulvilli, how oh, I am so happy to learn today. They secrete an adhesive fluid. Cool. Here to the second segment of the thorax, you have this one here. It kind of comes up and is rounded. It exists above where the wings are connected, and the wings connect just underneath it. So if your wings are a little high like mine, I'm going to be moving my wings down just a little bit to allow for this segment up here to be on the top. Uh, right now, the next thing that I am looking for are some easier lines to sketch in here. I'm obsessed with arthropod eyes. You know what? I think we're all allowed to have our own weird arthropod obsession. I think that that's allowed. Um, cool. Alright, so from right about here, we're going to be taking... Um, kind of right here at the base of the coxa, and I'm going to take it and round it down here. Um, the, there is a really nifty little triangular segment down here. There's a little triangular sclerite that's going to be connecting to the coxal segment, to the coxa. So, I'm going to erase that. The coxa is going to be coming down from this part here, so I'm going to make, I just had it too high up on my body originally, so I'm going to be pulling it down and just kind of creating, that's our little coxa here, and then the femur is going to be coming up on this fly. It's really tricky because I believe at some point, maybe this fly broke its leg and I glued it back on upside down, but that's not what it looks like. What it looks like is the fly's leg bent backwards. Um, but the femur is going to be really hard to see because of that. So what we'll do is um, I'll just explain you, to you what it looks like. Um, and honestly, it's going to be very similar to the front leg. The front and the middle leg are very, very similar in structure. So we've got the femur. It's going to be coming up like that. That's about right. I'm going to erase any of those little sketch lines on the inside I don't need. Um, and I can show you the tibia. so funny. So right here is where the weird bend happens that I don't understand. It's bent and the exoskeleton, so maybe it happened while I was pinning it. Um, the tibia starts here, comes down and bends this way, um, but it's not supposed to. It's supposed to be straight. Um, the tibia ends right about here. That's where these tarsal segments start, and it appears to have uh, four tarsal segments just like the first one. So one until about here, two, and then three and four at the very end. It 
It's starting to sound like Spider-Man is not so amazing. You should have gotten bit by a radioactive fly. <laughs> I love it. I mean, kind of. It would have been so... It would have been... It would be really, really cool to have a fly-inspired superhero. Although I think it might also be a tiny bit creepy because... I don't know. There is something about flies that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. Not all the time, but like... You look at them under a... You look at them from afar, and they're like, oh, that's super cool, and then you look at them close, and I think it's the bristles for me. Um, or all the challenges I had identifying them when I was learning them. All right. Tibia coming down. You still have tibial spines, and admittedly, I would like to say that there is almost a ring of tibial spines. Um, it's been kind of hard for me to show uh, because it's been a little bit dark, but um, I, you can see a little bit of the reflections. There's one, two, three here. Um, there's kind of this series, and there's I think there's actually four of them right there. Um, four tibial spines that kind of wrap around the bottom of the the bottom of the leg. So it would be on this side. Maybe only three visible from a lateral point of view, but there would definitely be four there. And then um, the same four, tibial, four tarsal segments. So what we're looking at is that first tarsal segment being nice and long, maybe about half of the length of the tibia this time. Um, the second segment, about half of that. Third, even smaller. And then that fourth one being round at the end with both of those pulvilli to help that to help the fly hold on to surfaces. Now we have this whole nice large reason of the th region of the thorax to fill in. Was this parody film superhero movie and the main character would be bitten by a radioactive dragonfly? Oh, cool! I mean, if I was going to be an insect, I'd want to be a dragonfly. There's one in Australia that can fly 59 miles an hour. So, specifically that one. of this region in the thorax, I'm only seeing kind of two more sclerites because you've got the middle one and the hind one. Um, and I was trying to kind of come up with where these are divided, but what it looks like is you've got this triangle down here on the bottom that is actually, instead of coming straight up, it is kind of wider here up on the top. And then this Okay. So and then let me see. Sorry guys. Playing around with these sclerites. Alright, so um it appears that you've got one set one um suture. The sutures would be the division in between the sclerites, right? So you have one suture that's coming up in this direction, one suture that comes down from this triangle and hits this one, and then um, your wings are actually going to be kind of right smack dab in the middle of this. So if you imagine kind of this is our wing here coming off of the fly, um, then we're going to have some additional characteristics back here, like the Calyptor. Um, let's see if I can get a little bit better lighting on the Calyptor. There we are. 
just going to overexpose the picture really quick to show this. Pretty sure that's how you spell it. Yes. Yay, we win. All right, so we are looking at the Calyptor, and that is right here. It's this little guy. Um, it comes out, it's flat, it has a little pointy end on the bottom. Sometimes the Calyptor is more, a lot of times the Calyptor is a light color, and it um, is um, very, very flat. Um, this one's flat. It's just black rather than kind of a beige color that I generally see it in. Um, the collector is connected, um, right above what we would call the halter. Um, I cannot see the halter right now, and that's kind of the point of the collector. Um, it protects the halter, so a lot of times what we call the collipterate flies, those are the flies with glyptors. Um, they, uh, you don't get to see their halteers, but the acalypterate flies, or the flies without these calypters, then you, then the, the, the halteer is much more obvious. So on a fly like a crane fly, that's acalypterate. So you can look up a really cool big picture of a crane fly and zoom in right underneath the front pair of wings and you'll see the halteer. It looks a little bit like this. It looks like a stick with a ball at the end of it. There you go. That is what a halteer looks like. Sometimes this knob at the end is more like... I don't know. It's always, it's always though, it's not always spherical. Sometimes it's ovoid, but it's always a knob. All right, so the um, halter, the clipter is coming out right around here. It's going to come on down, kind of. like that, and it's connected in there. All right, so um, that gives us front legs, middle legs, or pro legs, meso legs. <laughs> um, and then all we need is this. We're gonna draw the hind leg first and then do the abdomen because the hind leg is gonna have all types of cool stuff happening and I don't wanna have to erase the abdomen. So we're gonna do it this way. here at the very end, um, we are going to be adding this little bit of the thorax still, so connecting this one down. We are going to, I'm mostly going to be imagining that I'm adding the coxa segment because the coxa is right about here. So it's pretty much right underneath this middle leg, kind of where it's coming out. So this is going to be essentially the very edge of my coxal segment. And then I'm going to be putting the femur up no. anglet this way just a little bit. And then I'm going to be getting my femur and taking it up from here. Um, from this view, we actually can see the trochanter just a little bit. So we don't get to see the trochanter regularly. Um, you get the coxa and then the trochanter exists in between the coxa and the femur. Tends to be just like an itty bitty pizza shaped segment or a little triangular shaped like this. Kind of like 
a little triangular segment here, but that's essentially the knee. It helps it bend, and so then when you connect the femur, you connect it to the trochanter going in the direction the trochanter is. Thinking about etymology of calyptor, I wonder if it comes from the word cover or something like that. It makes me think of the calyx of a flower. Ooh, I like it. I bet you that calyx and calyptor are very similar here because P-T-E-R, tear, is the beginning of terra, which means wing. And so if calyx covers something, then maybe the C-A-L-Y means cover and the P-T-E-R is wing. So it's like a wing cover. But it's not covering a wing, it's covering the hind, it's covering the, um, the, the, um, the character that is the essentially the m not a hind wing but modified from it vestigial wing there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Hashi. I appreciate you. All right. So this femur is coming all the way up. It's a really long femur in comparison to the other ones. This femur is like double in length of the other femurs. So the, what we would say the meta femur The metafemur is fairly wide and also double in length of the pro and the mesofemurs. And then the tibia, oddly enough, it looks like it starts kind of thin and then it gets wider and narrows back down again. Look how cool it is! So that kind tibia, it reminds me of like a mohawk. I'm pretty sure that this fly has a mohawk on its hind leg. Alright, so starting kind of narrow, and then I'm going to make sure that it gets nice and wide. Just um, giving it a little bit of a, of a width here. The um, I'm not sure what we would call those because I want to call them hairs, but they're kind of wide and flat. I wouldn't call them bristles. I'd say that they're seedy. That's what I would call them, unless uh, we, um, I would call them seedy. Okay, so they start up at the top kind of narrow, because sometimes seedy can be plate shaped. Um, I have a really good image of a, um, of a weevil with um, CD that are shaped like this. Um, let me go ahead and show you that really quick. That's the, that's the reason why I looked a little bit confused is just because I don't know about fly anatomy tends to be have unique words. But um, this is a microscope image I took of um, CD on a weevil. And you can see, they're still considered hairs, but they're wide and flat, kind of plate-like. Um, essentially plate-like, like the uh, like scales on a butterfly's wing. But we, uh, when they're in beetles, we do consider them seedy. 
I'm just making sure that they get to be nice and wide here. mohawk love it all right then you have one two three let's see if it's four i, hope, I think that it's probably yeah it's four there are still four um four tip tarsal segments so we are looking at a four 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 tarsal formula on this fly here um and the hind leg where it has longer femur and longer tibia it's got shorter tarsal segments my guess would be it it's kind of to uh to um, even it out, you know? One, two, three, four, little little segment there at the end. And then you do still have the two tarsal claws and you still get those pulled lie at the bottom of its feet. So I will draw them like this, like two little claws and then half circles around them. Alright, so now all we have to worry about are the wings and the abdomen, and then um, pulling out a book and seeing if we can identify it. Let's see. They are almost feather shaped with a narrow stalk. Yes. They are... I'll, sh I'll we'll zoom in further. That's what they look like. They're kind of narrow and they come out like this. And they seem to be, they're flat in the direction that we are seeing them. So they look like they could kind of stack on top of one another. If CD can be plate shaped, then you don't understand the difference between CD and scales. double check this to make sure that I was correct. Um, CD is the word, is the umbrella term. A scale is a modified CD. CETA. CD is plural. Um, a scale is a modified CD. So um, we use the term scales in specific insects. Um, like butterfly wings, we call those scales, um, although they are technically modified seed. Um, yep. It's tricky because it depends on what insect you're talking about um, at that point because some orders prefer words to other words. Like in beetles, for instance, you're gonna use the word CD more than scales. Um, but in butterflies and moths, because there is such a distinction in between the CD that is on the body, the really fluffy hair, versus the scales on the wings, they're so distinctly different and they have such different um, roles that they give them different names even though they're adapted from the same body part. I hope that makes sense. And um, it always brings 
brings me back to the quote in the entomology lab at Michigan State University. I read it when I was a little person, and sometimes I still think about it. And that is, no, and it, and it does say man, but I like to say person. Um, the quote is, no one man can be considered an entomologist. The topic is just too vast for one human to comprehend or to understand. Um, the idea behind it is that entomology is such a huge topic that not one person can even has the ability to know it all. Um, and it's a quote that's, a, that's from a long, long time ago, and we have only increased in knowledge about bugs, you know? All right, so here we are. I'm going to be adding our um, abdomen. It, the abdomen appears to have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, there appears to be five abdominal segments on this fly here, so um, from where our abdomen connects, it is pretty, um, this abdomen is actually pretty rounded, so I'm going to be happy with just kind of rounding it out. Admittedly, my leg is going to block the entire end of my abdomen, but that says an upsetting to me. Um, and I can um, also zoom in on the end of the abdomen in case you want to add any of those more details. Uh, I said six, right? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. I hope I said five. All right, so let's see. One, two, three, four. All right, so the um, first one, two, three, four... The first three segments are fairly wide and equal to one another. The fourth segment is just a little bit smaller, and the fifth one is really kind of a teeny tiny one at the end. Um, and I'll go ahead and zoom in on that one to show you it momentarily. The uh, lateral for this fly, or the, uh, the edge of the top and the bottom sclerites for this fly, are is pretty low on the body here, so it's going to be right around here, pretty low. And then we can add, we're going to be adding the top segments, the top sclerites, separately from the bottom sclerites. The top ones get these nice, pretty rounded edges, and the bottom ones just get straight lines that come down. Um, we didn't uh, stack the top or the bottom because all of those segments kind of move smoothly into one another. Let's go zoom in at the end of the abdomen. I was looking at some photos of an especially fluffy winged moth earlier. Ah, so you were trying to make the distinction between the um, hair the hairy regions on the wing versus the scaly regions on the wing. Sometimes some of the scales really turn into very hair-like. It's possible that there is one additional very, very itty bitty teeny tiny abdominal segment right here at the end. That's why I'm zooming in. Um, right about here, there appears to be a little sliver of a segment um, at the end. It also could be a folded up mating appendage. No, it's a segment. There's another itty bitty teeny tiny slice of a segment right here at the very end of the abdomen. He is so cool! Alright, 
Um, I'm actually pretty happy now that I've gotten the entire uh, rest of the fly done. I'm pretty happy with the size of the wings that I've made. So I'm going to come back through and kind of darken this line here. And then erase any of these really light lines that are all over the place that I don't need. Cool. <laughs> awesome. So now we have a fly wing. Um, we get to draw some venation on here. Shifted a little bit. Oh, that doesn't work for the microscope. Worked better for me. Cool. All right, from the top of the wing, you have the costa and then the subcosta. Um, so you've got the costa that runs along the very, very front of the wing. The subcosta is the one that comes just underneath it. Um, this fly has some crazy wing venation. Alright, so there's this small vein that comes down and then meets the costa really, really quick at the base of the wing here. And I think that that is unique. Now, from it, we do continue. And this vein does go kind of almost all the way to the edge, and it has one more connection here. And when it gets all the way up to the very edge, it connects to the costa. It doesn't connect to the edge of the wing here. It um, wraps back around. You can see that right here, very, very narrowly. Now, We have one kind of main vein that comes along the center, comes up about halfway, and then splits. And this split is going to go one up towards this guy, and is going to kind of touch the tip of the wing. I'm making my wing just a little bit longer. So this one splits, comes up towards the vein, and then comes kind of down a little bit lower, except that this one never actually touches the end of the wing. What it does is there's a, there's a small, there's a cell. It creates a cell, but never touches the end of the wing here. It also splits really, really low, comes up, creates another shape here, and there's this S-shaped vein. So these veins actually never touch the edge of this wing here, and um, it's difficult to see under the microscope, but um, this white is not where the wing actually ends. There's a little bit of a, um, there's a clear region of the wing past the dark color, but because the microscope um, is trying to take into consideration how dark the fly is, it's blurring out this white region of the wing. All right, then at the very bottom of this one, this one actually does connect to the edge. And then I think that that's gonna be about it. Oh, except we do get one anal vein. There is one vein. My wing is too narrow. Okay. 
There is one anal vein that starts down here, kind of comes out, and then touches the bottom of the wing. So I'm going to use where the anal vein should go and then widen my wing just a little bit. Cool. Awesome. So that is our, that's our fly. Um, uh, let's see about, um, I have two things I want to check up on. Um, I am going to check on, I'm going to check on the fly anatomy chart that I want to share with you. And then we can, let's see, nope, we'll just use the Diptera review, see if we can get, see if we can ID it. Alright, so when I was taking classes, um, I would create these, um, I would create these kind of like cheat sheets that helped me um, identify and keep track of different identifying characteristics for families. Um, this was for an adult taxonomy class. Um, and what I think that I can do, I think that I can share my Word document with you in this. Yes, I can. Um, I can share my Word document with you, and then we can just kind of scroll through this really quick and see about what characteristics. Let's see. All right. So it's definitely not a moth fly or a crane fly or a midge. So we can skip a lot of these up here on the top because all of these flies up here on the top are acolypterate. So we know that our fly has collectors. Snipe flies have to have these three cells that ours does not have. It's not a tabanid or a rubber fly or a bee fly. It's not that. Some of these are really cool, like the um, uh, the big-headed fly, I kind of love them. They're huge. Uh, it's definitely not a surfid. These veins do not go, um, I was looking at the anthemiid, um, the, the veins don't go all the way to the edge of the wing. Californid flies have a wing venation that's very similar. Um, so I'm just going to write down our options really quick. So a Californid could be an option. I've not seen a Californid with these really um, fluffy tibia, but maybe there is an odd one. Um, because the wing venation was just about right. The sarcophagids have the four bristles. Nope. Tachinids have you know what? Look at that! It's a tachinid! Okay, so... <laughs> I'll show you something really cool. Here we are. Um, 
gets it to Kenneth. So, um, into Kennedy. Uh, the characteristic, the identifying characteristic on this fly is not shown in our drawing, sadly enough, because to see your distinguishing characteristic for Dakinids, you actually have to look this way in between the wings. So, um, you have heard the word scutellum used over and over again when we talk about beetles, right? The scutellum is in between the elytra. Um, but in flies, we also have a scutellum. It exists right here in between the wings, just like in beetles, um, but um, a lot of times in flies, the scutellum looks almost like um, the scutellum looks almost like a shelf here at the end of the top of the thorax. And because our wing is here, we can't see that the, see this shelf here. But um, when we look at it from this way, right about here, that is your scutellum. That's that, um, that, that like piece that comes up in between the wings. Now, in tachinids, this is what we call a post-scutellum. Um, it's the, it's like a little segment underneath the scutellum, kind of like this. Alright, this is the defining characteristic for tachinids. All tachinids are going to have what they call a post-scutellum that is well developed and prominent. Um, it's this additional little segment that kind of bulges out underneath the scutellum and we call it the post scutellum. Um, and funny enough, tachinids are also characteristically known to be, um, to have arista that are bare, so not very large and feathery, just a single hair, and um, they're known to be super, super bristly, like really, really fluffy. Um, or not like fluffy, but like really bristly, almost like they look like they could poke you over and over again, except that, um, this one doesn't have all of that, those huge number of bristles on the abdomen that I've come to know and love. As it turns out, the bristles on this guy are mostly on the hind legs, so I wonder if... wonder if we can find this guy. So this, um, so this fly was collected in New Jersey in 2022. Um, and tachinids are parasitoids. So this guy was, uh, this guy fed on somebody so that it could grow up big and strong. Oh my goodness, what's the chances that it is called a, s nope, not that one. But there are feather-legged, feather-legged tachinids. Cool! So I'm going to say that this is not a common tachinid in New Jersey because um, this species at least has not been, um, this species has not been um, posted onto iNaturalist. Um, but there is a fly called Trichopoda pinnipes and it's not this species. but. It has the exact same feather legs on the hind legs. This species here, Trichopoda penipes, um, has these same hind legs. So I am very confident that we are in the right family. So cool. 
And that makes me happy because I get... Really, I would not have guessed that body shape would be a Tekinen. Well, and that is why I was so confused by this fly and why it's been sitting unidentified in my collection. Because I hadn't spent the time to look at it and really kind of dive down. The wing venation is right for Tekinids. The Arista is right. The uh, the postcutellum is right. And um, you've got a, a very similar um, characteristic in a genus within Tekinids. So... Uh, we didn't ID it to species, we ID'd it to family, but hey, family works. Penny means feather. Cool. So cool. Thank you. Now I'm going to have to drop that identification. I'm actually going to write that identification and put it on the label because I don't know if I'm going to remember that. All right. Luckily, I have label paper next to me. Wait a minute. So, there they go. Not this one. Possibility that I just got that I am um, mixed up the location. That's why I don't remember collecting it in New Jersey. Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Hmm. Okay. All right. So that is our cute little Tekinid friend. Um, I'm happy that we were able to ID him together. Um, I really wanted to find the. Um, I really wanted to find my my document that had all of my identification links on it so that I could share with you an IDing for flies link. But I'm going to have to search for it a little bit and then I will go ahead and I'll post it on the Facebook post about today's class. That's where you're going to be able to find it. Um, you should post it on INET. You have the collection date and location so you could. That's true! That's true. I should just post it on iNet. I thought that iNaturalist really prefers live live specimens. And so I, um, um, yeah. I have, I have held myself back from posting pictures of pinned specimens because I know that iNaturalist is primarily for images of living insects. Aw, I miss you, Avea. Welcome! That's okay that you're late. Um, although we are going to be slowing down pretty soon here. Um, I have, like, a really long night ahead of me. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so, we got our identification in. I'm pretty happy with that. Oh, Pi is here, too! Look at that! We've had so many fun people here today! I really appreciate everybody coming and hanging out. Um, so, because you're all hanging out here, um, I want to show you a couple of things that I've been up to recently. So, starting um, this weekend, in fact, starting tonight, um, starting this weekend, I am traveling, um, and I'm just traveling on the weekends. I'm going out for... Um, and I'm going to be a part of a uh, convention called the World Oddities Expo. So I'm going to be traveling this year with the World Oddities Expo. They call it the WOE for short. Um, and the, I'll be in 16 different cities across the United States over the course of this next year. In fact, I have... 
I'm traveling for the next four weekends. So this weekend, I'm going to be in Kansas City. Um, next weekend, I'll be in Pittsburgh. Uh, the weekend after, um, I'll be in Miami. And then the weekend after that, I'll be in Richmond, Virginia. And so um, when I travel with them, I travel with live animals. We hold um, tarantulas and scorpions and stuff. And um, people can drop me any type of small donation so that they can kind of take a picture with their animals and have the opportunity to hold them. Um, I also have a booth where I, um, I sell little pieces of art. And um, there are a good variety, good number of you that know that I have been trying so hard to finish a coloring book um, along with staying on top of all of my other projects. And finishing the coloring book has been on the top of my list for, I don't know, months. Um, and I've been working on pages and I have not designed the cover yet. But what I did do, which is kind of cool, is I have finalized some of these line drawings. And not only do I have the line drawings all finalized and a little bit of information about the specimen on the bottom, but I'm QR code, I'm dropping a QR code on them and linking them to the YouTube video that I drew them on. So if a person wants to pick one of these up and color it, uh, they can actually go to the YouTube link and um, check out what the um, insect looks like in real life. Um, so I thought that that is really, really cool. And um, there is this dotted line around the edge of it. And that dotted line is not this there for fun. It's actually kind of strategic because the dotted line is cut at a 6 by 8. Um, it's a 6 by 8 cut. So, if you cut this out, um, you can put it in a 6x8 frame, or um, when I'm traveling to the World Oddities Expos up there, I am bringing um, already pre-cut matting um, that will mat out your picture, and then you can put it in like an 8x10 frame, and it'll have a matting, and it'll be gorgeous. So, I have something like, um, uh, I have something like, 20 of these completed with the QR code and the information and all of this stuff. The Chrysina Gloriosa was so much fun. Um, this Ichneumon, this Ichneumon wasp, I have not shown you guys. I haven't made a YouTube video of it just yet, but um, I drew it with some of my students and I love it. Loved the drawing so much that I had to add it and um, we'll have to draw it together sometimes. So, <clears throat> Um, it is a lot of travel. You've seen pinned insects. That sounds awesome. Awesome. All right. I'm trying to catch up. I am so ready to finish the coloring book. I promise. I've just been trying to make it like the absolute best possible. And guys, these are all, these are all like completed pages. And so when I'm traveling, I'm going to be selling individual completed pages along with pieces of matting. So not only can you color it in, but they can frame their work. Um, and then um, as I am finishing the pages, I can put them in here. And then once all the pages are done, I can put them into a book and sell them all together. And that is going to be so awesome. Now, outside of that, um, I decided to pick up a new thing because that's me. So um, I've been wood burning. Um, it's been kind of fun. So like these are little wood burned discs. And I'm going to be drilling holes in the top of them and hanging them, kind of like ornaments or hanging. Um, so this is a little butterfly head. It says antisocial butterfly. And then on the back it says stay buggy, Insectopia 2024. Um, there is this guy here. This is the wedge-shaped um, wedge beetle. And then on the back it just says Insectopia. This guy, he's a batacid. He's a, um, he's a hanging fly. Um, and on the back, I think it just says Insectopia. Um, oh, <laughs> this is the golden dung flies head. Um, and I thought that it kind of looked, uh, I liked the beard and the hair. So I put Confucius says, and because it's a dung fly, it says, stick to stuff you know. That's what it says. Um, and then this is a firefly head that says, leave the leaves. And on the back of this one, it's going to say this. 
but this one I realized when I pulled it I haven't finished burning it yet um, so it's gonna look like this when it's done so I have wood burned ornaments that I've that I've been created and working on and those are I have like 20 more of them being um, prepped on my dining table right now um, and then there's the drawings I have one more thing to show you because you guys are awesome and I like sharing my art with you I was going through my microscope images and I take pictures under my microscope a whole lot like a whole lot so I was going through pictures and thinking like how cool would it be to have some of um, to have some of these kind of prints um, available for people but I didn't know how big they should be so I ended up printing um, most of them in like four by four squares um, because then you can see things like oh this one's cool um, this is the head of, um, and this is the head of a beetle here. Um, and, I don't know, oh, the, the plates from the weevil we looked at today. Uh, 4 by 4 print of him, and this is the weevil that those scales, that those CD belong on. Look at me saying skits, scales. Um, and, like, the wing of the, of this butter, of this moth right here, the, um, the white line stinks moth, and it's proboscis. You can see it's proboscis curled outside of its body. So this is its proboscis and its hind wing. Um, I don't know, really cool wing venation. Um, and different, just like different images. And admittedly, I just couldn't pick. So I ended up printing something. Oh, this one's... That's the golden dungfly's head. See? He's so cute. Um... So I have four by four prints of um, my of macro photography. Um, I some of them, like some of the really cool heads, I printed in eight by eights. Um, and this image here, this black and white image of the uh, thistle down velvet ant, um, it actually I entered it in a photo contest a little bit ago, and it won um, people's choice. It won people's choice. Um, I printed it in a big 10 by 10. Um, and I thought that that was really cool. So I printed it kind of smaller, black and white. But um, yeah, so like this one, so cool. The head of this butterfly, this is a sulfur. The head of a sulfur butterfly. Um, I don't know. You know, the hind legs of bees because pollination and stuff. Uh, this is that wedge-shaped beetle's head. I don't know. I wanted to share these with you. There you go. I'll get a little beetle head. Um, so, um, I, so that is what I've been doing and what I am up to, and I wanted to share that with you. I printed, I went through my images, and I got rid of all the ones that I definitely was like, no, I don't need to print those, and then I went through a second time, and by the time I'd gone through all of my images twice, I had narrowed my pictures down to 120 pictures. <laughs> So, instead of picking just a handful and then printing a whole bunch of them, I printed 120 pictures four times each. And then I figure the ones that people say are their absolute favorite, then I'll just end up printing more of those specific ones. Because um, I'm not sure what everybody else likes. I know what I like. I know what I think looks really cool. Like this one, I think is a really cool image, not because it's the side of this beetle, but because there's another little critter riding on the beetle. I think that that's so cool. Um, can I tell people about your prints when I do announcements for JML's class? Uh, yes. Yes, you can do that. Um, I have not figured out, so I have not posted these for sale on my website yet. Um, the plan is to post them for sale on my website, um, but beef oh, this is a really cool picture of Pulvilli, by the way. Those little pads underneath the tarsal claws. Um, 
I have not yet posted these images to my website just yet, um, but if you already know people who are interested in buying prints of things, or you want to talk about them, I'm cool with that, and I will um, figure out how to make that work. Yes. Um, all of the images that I printed are technically on my Instagram, all right? So I don't think I printed anything that wasn't on my Instagram. Um, <clears throat> not all of the pictures on my Instagram I printed, but all the ones I printed are there, see? Um, kind of like squares and rectangles. Um... Yeah, I guess wait for me for about, give me one week. Um, these just, I just received these on Wednesday. They're going to be seen for the first time by people who can purchase them on Saturday. And right after this live stream, I'm going to finish wood burning the ones that I have already prepped. And I am going to start an 11-hour drive to Kansas City. Unless I have too much to do and then I will drive in the morning. Um, but uh, I will, I have a handful of things to do, but I think that once these are on the website, it'll be really, really easy for me to, um, for me to send you guys there. Um, but until then, maybe, maybe these are just spoilers. Yeah, they're just spoilers. I really appreciate all the support that I receive from everybody here. Um, um, Susan and Avea and Pi and Chaos and Hashi and um, I think we had a couple of other students. Matthew Helms joined us today again um, from the Southeastern Nature Southeastern Michigan Nature Journaling Club, which is awesome. And um, we had the the up close the nature up close um youtube channel join us today too i just really appreciate all of the um all of the support that i get here on youtube and you guys are sincerely the reason that i'm still doing this oh can i tell you We just hit the two-year anniversary of doing live streams. I have been live streaming almost every Thursday for two years now. I was looking at some of my older sketches, and um, the first sketch we did was a cogwheel assassin bug, and it was in the beginning of February 2022. Um, like February 8th, I think, 2022. So, um... Thank you so much for being here and sticking around and for drawing bugs with me every Thursday for two years. I can't even, I can't even believe the amount of support that I receive from you guys, and I really appreciate it. And we're just going to keep going. Um, and I'm going to have actual products now that I can, like, sell and show off. Um, which is going to be even better. We are always working on getting, we are always working on improving and this is always a fantabulous time. Now, it's about time for me to say goodbye because it is almost midnight and I do have a handful of things to do before I'm allowed to go to bed or start a drive. Um, I teach on out school. Right now, my out school classes are only Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. All right? I have minimized my class schedule because of the amount of weekend traveling I will be doing this year. I am traveling at least two weekends every month from now until the end of the year um, doing this um, with the Oddities Expo. So um, if you know a student, ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, 13 to 18, like a student-aged student and would like bug classes, I do this virtually through Zoom on a platform called OutSchool. And if you find the link in the doobly-doo below, um, then you can... Um, save you can receive twenty dollars from out school for taking your first classes and my classes i charge um ten dollars a week per student 
Um, so you could have a student that gets two weeks of free classes just by using that link below. Super nifty. Make sure you subscribe. I love all of you that already do. Um, and I know that if you are commenting, you are subscribed. So thank you from the deepest part of my heart. Um, right there is a, um, is a PayPal link where you can donate to me. Um, but um, if you saw something today that you would like to purchase because you... Um, if you saw something today while I was looking or, or, or while I was showing these pictures off that you would really like to purchase or you're really interested in, what I would love is for you to email me and tell me what you want. <laughs> because that would not only inspire me to get all of my stuff on my website, but help me organize and understand which, which things are going to be kind of the most popular, and it'll help guide me towards um, what I will continue to do and what I will leave behind. All right, if you want to share your drawing with me, um, please go to my Facebook page. I will be posting my drawing of this cute little Tekinid friend um, on my Facebook page. Um, Facebook, my link is at Insectopia2015. That was the year I established. Um, and that's also the tag for Instagram. So if you wanted to go and look at some of my macro, macro photography um, and see what types of images I have, um, I have printed, um, you can check out my Instagram at Insectopia2015. Um, I believe that is everything. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Um, have a fabulous rest of your week, and next week I will let you know how my first traveling show went. Um, I hope that you all learn, um, learn something great, and uh, stay buggy. Bye.